Amen. Praise God. Praise Amen. God. All right. Okay, so tonight we're looking at lesson number two, who wrote the Bible? Lesson number two, who wrote the Bible? And uh, we have several people who cannot attend tonight. And um, as as is um, my style, I will send each of you an email tomorrow with the link to the um, archive, to the, the recorded version of this class. Okay, uh, here's a major announcement, two major announcements. One, uh, write this down, no class on July 4th. No class on July 4th. The second major announcement is look for my email announcing a different hookup starting next Wednesday. A different uh, dial in, a different online hookup for the online classes. We're coordinating everything with Paul and his website. And so uh, starting next week, we're go I'm going to send you uh, a connection to free conference our free conference.com service and um and how to get your videos on paul's website starting next week um actually you'll probably get this video on paul's website tomorrow i'll send you the email so two major announcements one no online class on july 4th however homework is due for that week. The second major announcement is that um, we will change the whole uh, approach to our online classes instead of um, me teaching by way of this website, go to meetme.com. Um, there be a whole different uh, internet connection. I will send you out a whole different connection how you can connect with me on freeconference.com. I will send this out a couple times to you before next week. Also, for those of you who follow us on the the uh, the uh, Back to Basics online church where I'm teaching in a series on why every believer ought to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this week will be part three on the gift of faith. Every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, um, we, uh, we're working on uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I will send you uh, send you out those of you who choose to come on. I will send you out the email to connect on Sunday morning for that. Okay, praise God. Well, bless God. Let's start off with our homework assignment. Let's look at what is due for this coming week, and that's found on page 345 of your textbook page 345 of your textbook appendix a uh, for those of you who are new to the course uh shauna just joined uh shauna uh shauna did your textbooks arrive yet yes they did yes okay shauna reduce your volume also okay Reduce I did it again. Okay. Um, I'm glad your textbooks arrived. So we, we give you a little time to catch up. But this week you can uh, start in on lesson one. Um, and um, it, it won't take you long to catch up. Uh, so starting today, the layout of the textbook, Shauna, and for those of you um, listening for a review, uh, we have our 12 lessons. And we go through the 66 books of the Bible in 12 lessons. And then after uh, the book of Revelation, we have Appendix A. Appendix A is your exercises and responses section. That's also known as your self-test. There are no exams in this course, no midterm exam and no final exam. But you have a weekly self-test. The weekly self-test is the same as answering the exercises and responses in Appendix A. And so in uh, this week's self-test for Lesson 2, there are 12 questions. Uh, answer those 12 questions. And to check yourself, to grade yourself on these 12 questions, turn to 
uh, lesson two in appendix B. So the questions are found in appendix A, the answers are in appendix B. Please do not send these questions to me. Uh, answer them in your in your your workbook and then grade them yourself just to let you let uh, let yourself know how you're doing. Okay, so we're going to look at these questions on page 345, and these are your self-test questions. I'm sorry, Jackie, I messed that up, didn't I? These are the questions you are to send to me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. These are the questions you are to send to me. Jackie and I were out picking blackberries today in all this hot sun. It's 95 degrees here in Atlanta, in the Atlanta area, 95 degrees. And we're out there picking blackberries in the hot sun. But we got we got about a quart, two quarts. We got two quarts today. So, um, so I, uh, I made a mistake. Let's review this for the for the self test or exercises and responses section. Yes, email these to me. This is your homework assignment. Okay. So question one: Were all the prophets writers of books? You are to answer that. Question two: Name two prophets who use secretaries. To write their books for them, just name two. Um, they use secretaries, or the term might be they use an amanuensis. We, we shorten that to secretary. Name two, name two of them. Uh, number three, name three secretaries who wrote books of the Bible. Um, you'll find this in in this week's lesson. Name three secretaries who wrote books of the Bible. Lesson four lists five kinds of materials that were used for writing in biblical days. Five kinds of materials used for writing in biblical days. Praise God. And um, coming down off the mountain trail today, Jackie and I were thinking about blackberry juice uses ink, but no, they didn't use blackberry juice, uh, but use five kind, name five kinds of materials that were used for writing in biblical days. Question number five, two big words in here. What were the apocrypha? What were the pseudepigrapha? Do not be afraid of these words. Apocrypha, pseudepigrapha. There's a paragraph on the apocrypha and the pseudepigrapha. Later, in a separate lesson, we will spend more time with the apocrypha and pseudepigrapha. In your study of this lesson this week, Identify the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha very briefly, okay? How did the Apocrypha differ from the Pseudepigrapha, okay? And so uh, the word Pseudepigrapha is a Greek word. Pseuda means false. And give you a hint, uh, grapha, books, writings, false writings, false writings. And then there was a Amen. group of books called the Apocrypha. Okay, hi Sylvia. Hi, Mr. Carter. God bless you. God bless you. And uh, we're praying for for you, Sylvia. Everybody, we're praying for Sylvia Curtis. Um, Sylvia, Sylvia's mother passed, and her mother lives in Germany. And so we're praying much for you and for your family, Sylvia. And we love you. And uh, you just continue trusting in the Lord. Give our greetings to Vernon. Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Yeah, the Holy all Spirit right. really helped me through that and comfort me. God bless you all. Praise God. God bless you now. Also, we want you mm. at this time and for classes, mute your phone. Press star and six. Star and six. Then uh, when you want to talk or, or ask a question, you unmute your phone by pressing star and six. So right now, for the sake, for the, because we're, uh, taping, and uh, we, we want everybody listening to the tape to pray for Sylvia Curtis. Okay, hold her up before the Lord. All right, now Sylvia's going to mute her phone with star and six. Number six, which two of the gospel writers were, wrote from firsthand knowledge? Two of the gospel writers were right there with Jesus. They saw everything, heard everything from firsthand. Then question seven, which two of the gospel writers wrote from secondhand knowledge? And you'll, uh, in your textbook, 
you might want to remove that equal sign and put a, a dash there uh, or a hyphen uh, in the question seven. Remove the equal sign and replace it with a hyphen or a dash. Question number eight, who wrote the last book? I'm sorry, who wrote the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy? And how do you know? It's a tricky question, um, but Moses did not write the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. So answer that and tell me who wrote it, and then how do you know? The obvious answer is Joshua, but be careful, okay? Be careful, be careful. The answer is in, in, the, in, in the textbook. Question nine, who wrote the last chapter of the book of Joshua? Now, everyone's going to guess, most people will guess it was Ezra. But no, no, the answer was not Ezra. So read your, read your lesson. And, and, and these are two tricky questions. Who wrote the last book, last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy? And how do you know? And then who wrote the last chapter of the book of Joshua? These are just two uh, questions I have a little bit of fun with with my students. And uh, look here, look here. Don't labor over these questions, okay? If <clears throat> after you read, when you read the chapter, it will, it, will, it will stand out to you because I think I mentioned why and, and gave you the answer. But uh, just to give you a little hint, Moses did not write all of the book of Deuteronomy. Um, uh, something happened to him so that he could not write anymore. And the same thing happened to Joshua. So he couldn't finish his book. So you'll have fun with that. Number 10, at your best guess, at your best guess, who is the author of the book of Esther? Who do you think was the author of the book of Esther? And the, the chapter will give you a little, 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 uh, a little hint. Um, 11, write the following scripture from memory. Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. Our memory verses, you have three verses, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. God who in sundry times, meaning God in, in, in times past, uh, spoke uh, to us through the prophets. And then number 12, ask God to speak to you about Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. We're not going to forget what we learned in our first course, communion with God, and we continue in our courses about journaling. And those who are new to this class, and have not taken previous courses in the Paul Begley School of Prophecy. Journaling, journaling is the way in which uh, when you quiet yourself down and seek spontaneity, in other words, you're going to listen for what spontaneous words come forth. Quiet yourself down. Uh, repent of your sins. You can't hear from God with sin in your heart uh, unless God is telling you to stop sinning. Now, you'll hear that. Uh, if your heart's not hardened, but to hear from God, to get clarity from God, quiet yourself down, quiet your mind down, uh, make sure there are no idols in your heart, nothing in your heart bigger than God. If you're praying and your uh, uh, your wife means more to you than God, you're not going to hear much from God. You're going to hear through your wife. Or if your husband means more to you than God, you're not going to hear from God. You'll hear through your husband. So that we should have no idols in our heart. So this 12th question uh, asks us to journal about what God is speaking to you about Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. So quiet yourself down. Quiet your mind. Quiet your spirit. Confess any sins. And then go to God and say, God, what would you like to say to me personally about Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. You might want to uh, reread those verses and then uh, hear what God has to say about this um, particular set of verses. Okay, so and then listen, listen. Sometimes people miss God because they ask them a question and they dash into uh, 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 doing some, some kind of work or dash off, but stay there, stay there. Wait on the Lord. And God will speak to you. That's what journaling is all about. We get a lot of direction for our lives, ladies and gentlemen, when we journal and when we trust God and wait on him for his timing. So those are your 12 questions for homework. Are there any questions on the homework questions? And if so, please unmute your phone and uh, 
ask or ask Jackie in the in the chat room. I want to make sure everyone's clear on the questions. Once again, I apologize for saying no. Do not send these to me. I was presumptuous, and 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 and, and in error. Yes, please send these to me. That is your homework. Okay, praise God. All right, then let's flip back to chapter two of our homework, and our lesson is who wrote the Bible. I find this in my studies of the Bible, and I've been studying the Bible for many years, and uh, I'm always excited about teaching a course on or a lesson on who wrote the Bible. Another fascinating area that really turns me on is how we got our Bible. Uh, those writers, many of the writers who wrote the, the, the books, they suffered. But then those translators suffered a lot. Um, uh, hopefully, eventually, I think we may include in this course at later on a little a little portion of a lesson on how we got our Bible, how the Bible came to us from the Hebrew and from the Greek into the English language and then into the vernacular languages. Ladies and gentlemen, it was not easy for those pioneers who translated uh, Hebrew documents and Greek documents into the Latin and then from the Latin into the English. And um, I'll tell you now, one man was burned to the stake in England. They burned him to the stake for translating the Bible from the Vulgate, from the Latin, into, his name was John Wycliffe, W-Y-C-L-I-F, or some spell it W-Y-C-L-I-F-F-E. They burn him to the stake for translating the Bible into a language that everyone could read. And this was the Catholic Church. They, they did not want anybody reading the Bible. They wanted it in Latin. And nobody understood Latin. Uh, nobody, hardly anybody understands Latin today. But God wants his word to be made so plain that, that even a baby can understand uh, the words from God. And so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this was just one man who, who was killed. Many people were put to death for translating the Bible. So this gives us a great appreciation of the Bible. Incidentally, 100 years after they burned John Wycliffe at the stake, they were still angry with him. And 100 years later, they dug up his bones and burned his bones. I mean, that's, that, that's, that, that is hatred. That is not love. That was not love, ladies and gentlemen. But men, uh, many men and women sacrificed their lives translating the Bibles. And then many sacrificed their lives smuggling the translations into different countries in the world. And people are still paying the price, ladies and gentlemen, for trying to get the Bible into the hands of people in their known languages. So this whole thing, who wrote the Bible, how we got our Bible, is very fascinating. Look at Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the throne, right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This is not an easy scripture to memorize, ladies and gentlemen. So I, I uh, want to encourage you to get a 3 by 5 card or uh, several 3 by 5 cards and write, write the clauses and the phrases out. You might want to take uh, God, who at sundry times and in, and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Write that much on a 3 by 5 card. Then on another 3 by 5 card, hath in these last days spoken to, unto us by his son. And put that on a separate card. Then 
whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Put that on a card, on a card. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, put that amount on a separate card. And upholding all things by the power, by the word of his power, put that on a separate card. When he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high, separate that. Being made so much better than the angels, you might want to separate that. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. You're going to, you're going to, uh, my way is to take about eight or nine three by five cards, write these clauses, go from comma to comma, or uh, from comma to civil, semicolon, and learn a portion each day and add on each day until you have it in your spirit ladies and gentlemen getting the scripture in our spirit is so important because i've said as i've said last week and you'll hear me say again and again and again the day is coming the day is coming when there will be no bibles we believe we truly believe and i've been hearing this from god for 30 years the day is coming when there will be no bibles Bibles will be outlawed even in the United States. And so we are urged to hide the word of God in our hearts. How do we hide the word of God in our hearts? By memorizing the word of God. Memorizing, memorizing, and reciting the word of God. That's, that, that is, uh, that's what we do. Memorize it and recite it uh, to God. Praise God. What's up, Jackie? Ladies and gentlemen, my wife Jackie, my precious wife Jackie, she just came to make sure we're teaching from the right book. Now, we I can understand that. She picked blackberries today and the sun got to her and all that sort of thing. But uh the it's the blue book, baby, the blue and white book, not the red and white one. See, we've published also a book called uh the Bible in one year workbook. It's similar to this. This is a book we use in when we go to other nations. And when we set up schools and seminars in other nations. So my precious wife was just checking to make sure we're in the right book. Okay, praise God. Praise God. Y'all give Jackie, show her some love. Show her some love in the chat room. Praise God. Okay, in this section, let's be familiar with the writers of the Bible. Keep this in mind. The Bible was not written all at once. The story of the writing of the Bible is the story of how God chose over 40 different people over a period of 1,600 years to write his word. And when, the, when you look at the list of writers later in this chapter, I think the number is, there are about 47 people that I've listed in this chapter who were writers of the Bible. God chose them over a 40-year period. Uh, over over a 1600 year period he chose over 40 people each of the writers wrote what god breathed into them and their writings were passed on from generation to generation even as these 40 men who were handpicked by god wrote their prophecies or their preaching assignments there were other prophets and preachers whom god was using at the same time for example, during Isaiah's time, there were other prophets operating on behalf of God's call on their lives. The same is true in the case of Jeremiah and many other prophets. Keep this in mind also. All prophets were not writers. I think that answers one of the questions in your homework. All prophets were not writers. All prophets did not record their prophecies in writing. Some writers or prophets used secretaries. Jeremiah had a secretary named Baruch. Paul often used a secretary because Paul had severe eye problems. The apostle Paul could barely see. Remember when he was blinded on the road to Damascus? Paul went through most of his life with serious eye troubles and could barely see. That is why in some of his letters, he would say, see, I'm signing this in my own handwriting. His handwriting, the experts say, was very large because Paul could barely see. 
Okay, in first in Philemon 19, Paul write, wrote, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. In Second Thessalonians, Paul co-authored the letter. The other writers who helped Paul were Silvanus and Timothy. Paul tells his readers at the end of the letter that he wrote the salutation, but the core of the letter was written by Silvanus and Timothy. Silvanus, uh, we know him as Silas. Silas. Okay, the writers of the Bible, listen to this, they did not have typewriters, they did not have word processors, uh, they could not text, uh, they did not have technological instruments, um, they could not transcribe their spoken words, they could not uh, speak into a machine and the machine prints out what they had to write. No way, these men wrote uh, with whatever materials were available, and they had to find materials that would, would not uh, wash away. They had to find ink that would dry, it would not uh, run if it got wet. And they had to sometimes hide, uh, uh, write on scrolls and animal sh skins and sheep skins and then roll these and put some dust on them to keep them from uh, uh, deteriorating. And then they would roll these scrolls and put them into clay pots uh, for protection. So writing, writing was a whole different ball game um, in biblical times. Often uh, they did not have big pens or smooth writing pens or pencils. Often they used a crude pen called a stylus, a stylus, which was a sharp object with a definite point or tip that could be dipped in ink or a liquid. Oftentimes bird feathers could be sharpened into a point and dipped into a fluid to write or record information. Moses, Paul, and other writers could not go to Staples or uh, Office Max or Kinko's and purchase a ream of writing paper. Instead, they wrote on the back of sheep skins and other animal skins. These materials were called parchments. You'll find in 2 Timothy, when Paul asked Timothy to come before winter, one of his requests was bring the parchments, bring the writing materials. The skins of sheep and goats were often specially prepared to be used as writing materials. Sometimes they used papyrus, which was a paper-like substance that was made from a special tree that, that was uh, it served for writing purposes. In biblical times, um, books did not have covers like our books do today. A book in those days was made up of, made up of several sheepskins or goatskins that were sewn together and rolled up into a scroll. A special kind of material or dust was used to preserve the writings on the scrolls. In order to protect the scrolls, they were often placed in glass jars or clay vases and kept in a dry place where they could not be rotted or contaminated by rain, water, or other elements. The whole writing process was fascinating. Knowing this gives us an even greater appreciation for the Bible. Then God chose 40 men. Now ladies, it just happens that God chose 40 men. So don't argue with me about that. Why did God choose 40 men? I don't know, because because men in those days uh, uh, were his choice, okay? Um, uh, but God uses women. Jackie and I were talking about to that today on our walk. God uses women, and we're not going to bash women. God uses men, women, and children in in ministry. God chose 40 men over a period of 1,600 years to write the Bible, okay? Um, and so the, many wrote letters, and those letters became books of the Bible. Even the story of how the Bible books were chosen, the Old Testament books were chosen by a council of rabbis uh, around the second century B.C. A council of rabbis uh, came together, and they read all of the writings and all of the so-called spiritual writings, uh, many were uh, 
said to be anointed writings, and the rabbis chose the 39 books that made up the Old Testament canon. And then in the New Testament era, around the year 325 A.D., at the Council of Nicaea, then the, uh, uh, the New Testament elders, the uh, uh, elders of the church, the bishops they were called, the bishops chose the 27 books of the New Testament and they added them to the 39 books of the Old Testament era and that's how we got 66 books in the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many books that were excluded from the list that we call our Holy Bible. And so uh, you may uh, see in the Catholic Bibles, I have one up in my bookcase here, and in that bookcase I have in the Catholic Bible, and it's also found in the Greek Bible, and in some Protestant Bibles, you'll have a list of books in the center of your Bible. These books are called the Apocrypha books or the Pseudepigrapha, the Apocryphal books or the Hidden books, the Hidden books. Uh, uh, they're called the hidden books and the pseudepigrapha, the word that means the false books. And the difference is um, the apocryphal books were, it was doubtful about their authorship was, uh, was doubtful and uh, the spirituality was doubtful. And the, the books called the pseudepigrapha, uh, many of them were written and attributed to biblical characters but the biblical characters did not write those books that's why they're called false books or pseudepigrapha false books false writings pseudepigrapha okay uh even in 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 our chapter on the pseudepigrapha and apocrypha we do have a pronunciation key okay so there we show you how to pronounce apocrypha and pseudepigrapha okay but many did not make it into the old testament canon the 39 books that were chosen by the old testament uh, rabbis and many did not make it into the 27 books chosen by the new testament elders or the bishops in at the council of nicaea and so what you have a lot of books ladies and gentlemen out there hundreds of writings hundreds of writings but we have uh, classified, the scholars have classified many of these writings into the Apocrypha and many into the Pseudepigrapha. Now, we do not accept these books as being spiritual or anointed or Holy Ghost appointed. Now, there are people who teach from these. There are preachers who preach from these. Uh, Paul, in one of his letters, referred to a book. Uh, Paul referred twice, I think, to uh, apocryphal books and other writers uh, refer to these books these books are good for history uh, but then some of them get into the area of fairy tales and 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 a vain imaginations and so the Holy Spirit did not move on the part on the in the lives of the Old Testament bishops uh, the Old Testament elders and the New Testament bishops and so we must trust that the Old Testament elders, uh, rabbis who met in council to choose the books that are now what we call the Old Testament, and the, the, the bishops who met at Nicaea and, and other meetings to choose the writings, we must believe that the Spirit of the Lord moved upon these to choose these books and to eliminate others. Yet, ladies and gentlemen, we have... Uh, uh, social organizations like the Masonic Order and the Order of the Eastern Star and a lot of these uh, social groups uh, they have access to these apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books and they're the ones who claiming are claiming they have deeper knowledge than the Christians uh, they, because they 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 said we have access to the lost books and a lot of their rituals and a lot of their practices ladies and gentlemen are based on the writings in the 
uh, pseudepigraphal and the apocryphal books. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wouldn't tamper with them. I'm not going to get into that area called witchcraft. I'm going to obey the Lord. I believe in all scripture. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and for instruction in righteousness that the child of God may be thoroughly equipped. I'm going to go along with that scripture and say what's in uh, what I find between the pages of Genesis and Revelation that is holy writ that is holy scripture that's my bible that's what i believe in my life depends on it i believe it and that settles it you can uh i i do not urge you to preach from the apocrypha or to preach from the pseudepigrapha but if you do use those references as historical references but please tell your audience where you're coming from uh uh I'm not going to get into that because when you get into uh, quoting from books like Bell and the Dragon, 1st Esdras, 2nd Esdras, Tobit, Judith, uh, 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 you're getting into uh, uh, dangerous ground. Okay, so that's uh, what we teach on the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. You'll see more in another chat, another lesson. In this book the real author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit I'm on page 24 of our textbook the Holy Spirit is God the third person of the Trinity and we read that the Bible was divinely inspired the word inspired means God breathed God breathed God breathed his breath upon the writers and they wrote what God breathed the Holy Spirit spoke to them and they wrote what they heard the Holy Spirit say. Just like when Jesus said, I do not do anything unless I see my father do it or I don't say anything unless I hear my father speak it. Well, the writers of the Bible, we believe God breathed on them and they wrote what God gave to them. Okay, praise God. Um, look at Second Peter 1.21. 1 20 and 21 second peter 1 20 and 21 knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the privacy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit these men these 40 men did not just write what was on their mind paul on one occasion said he had the liberty. The Holy Spirit gave him to the liberty to write what he was thinking in one of his one of his passages. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is God breathing on people because God has a plan. God has a purpose for each of these writings. And when you put all of these writings together, do not separate the Old Testament from the New Testament because the Old Testament is a story of how God uh, separated a family of people and out of that family God himself came to earth to live uh, for 33 years to hang on a cross and die for the sins of all mankind it took a lot for God to shape that family Satan tried everything he could to try to destroy that family I have a book that I've written called um, the Giants are back the Giants are back and you can contact me for a copy of this book it's about 360 pages in, in which I trace the history of, of Satan trying to destroy the seed of woman. When God uh, spoke in Genesis 3.15 that uh, the serpent would bruise his heel and he would bruise the head of Satan, Satan realized that a Messiah is coming and he did all he could. He disrupted everything in the Garden of Eden and from the Garden of Eden on to the time of the cross, Satan did everything he could to destroy God's seed, to prevent God's seed from coming to crush him. This is the story of how he raised up a, a race of giants, ladies and gentlemen. Satan created with by using the, <clears throat> the fallen angels 
and he had them procreate with women, fallen angels and women, and he produced a race of giants and he planted them in the promised land, in the Canaan land. Why? To populate that land and prevent God's people from coming into that land. It's a fascinating book, and um, it it all it deals with uh, Genesis chapter four six six four that there were giants in the land, and then we go from that uh, place to show how even after Jesus was born, Satan tried to destroy the seed, try to keep him off the cross. And now that uh, you and I have been saved, Satan is trying his best to destroy us, to keep us from sharing the gospel, to keep nations from loving God, to keep people from receiving God. And he's using all kinds of giants, modern day giants. So contact me for a copy of this book, uh, The Giants Are Back how Satan is using modern day giants, not just huge people, but he's got demons in, in high places, demons sitting in government places, demons making policy, demons in households, demons destroying the American household and the nations of the world, demonic activity. We call them giants and we expose the giants and uh, show uh, what's going on. And so um, the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is so important. Do not, don't let anybody tell you, I am a New Testament, Testament uh, uh, Christian. Ladies and gentlemen, and, and if you have been taught that way, please re reconsider your position. Don't say I'm a New Testament Christian, because if you're just a New Testament Christian, you're throwing the baby out with the wash water. You're getting rid of all of that great uh, anointed word and history from Genesis through Malachi as God prepared the world to receive his only begotten son. And so we look at the whole gospel. We look at the full gospel. We look at the whole Lagos. And in addition to the Lagos, <coughs> we are learning how to journal, how to talk to God. We read the word of God and we can ask God questions and God will speak to us with a rhema word. Ladies and gentlemen, the very fact that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that believers have the Holy Spirit on the inside and God wants you to get filled with the Holy Ghost is so that you can be led by the Spirit. The Bible is a guide. The Bible is our schoolmaster. But God himself wants to indwell every believer. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about what God's plan is and what his desire is for mankind, we need the scriptures, but we also need the filling of the Holy Spirit. And ladies and gentlemen, once you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you do not throw your Bible away because what the Holy Spirit teaches is complementary, is the same as what the Bible is saying. He is not going to teach you anything that's contrary to the Bible. But God's grand design, ladies and gentlemen, and the reason why we have this Bible, God wants to speak to us. And he wants us to hear, man, my time is getting away from me. My time is getting away from me. But God wants to speak to us. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants to commune with us. I pray that if this is your first course in the Paul Begley School of Prophecy, go back and, and one, one semester soon, take the course Communion with God. You see, when God told Moses to lead the children out of Egypt, God told Moses to bring them to the mountain. God brought them, uh, Moses led them to Mount Sinai. God's plan, ladies and gentlemen, was to talk <coughs> to each individual, was to talk to each person individually. God's plan was to minister to each person individually. He wants a personal relationship with every one of us. And so God had Moses bring all the people to the mountain. The mountain was trembling. It was shaking. Smoke was coming up out of the mountain. Fire was belching up out of the mountain. And the people were scared. Or as we say down here in Georgia, they were scared. They were scared. And, and when God began to speak to the people, they were so afraid that after that episode, they said to Moses, 
Moses, tell God, we do not want him to speak to us this way anymore. He scared us, and we're afraid of him. So if God, and the people said to Moses, if God wants to speak to us, let him speak to you, Moses, and then you tell us what God said. That's how preaching came about, ladies and gentlemen. God's original plan was to commune with people one-on-one. -on -one. He wants to speak to us on a one-on-one. -on -one. And um, because the people rebelled and, and dishonored God and didn't want to go along with his plan, they said, no, we'd rather have preachers. We'd rather have prophets. And so that's how prophecy came along. Uh, uh, that's how prophecy was enhanced. Prophecy had existed since the time of, of uh, um, Abel. And so God began to speak to us through his chosen vessels. Praise God. And thank I thank God for the people he's chosen to speak to his people. But God wants a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. So we want to encourage you in this wonderful school. Man, I didn't even get to who wrote the books of the Bible. But if you flip to page 29 in your textbook, you'll see this whole list. You'll see Moses writing Genesis 1 th through Deuteronomy 33. Uh, he could not answer. He could not finish Deuteronomy 34. I'll give you a hint because Moses was dead and dead men don't write books. Okay. And so Joshua completed the writing of Deuteronomy. Same with Joshua. Joshua could not write the last chapter of the book of Joshua because he died also. And so Phineas, Phineas, it's uh, listed near the, on uh, the top third of page 30. Phineas completed the book of Joshua. So look through this list. You see people like Samuel, Nathan, Gad, David, Asaph. You see Korah's descendants, a whole list of his descendants, Asir, Elkanah. Abiasaph, Tahath, Uriel, Uzziah, Shaul. These were Phineas's, these were Korah's descendants who wrote portions of the Bible. Then we go down, we look at Ethan, Haman, Solomon, Agor, Lemuel, Ahijah, Iddo, Shemaiah, Jehu, Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, Hezekiah. Hezekiah didn't write any books of the Bible. But Hezekiah was a compiler. He collected writings. Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Baruch, who was the secretary for Jeremiah, Habakkuk. And when you um, mention Habakkuk, put the K on the end of his name. Habakkuk, not Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Daniel, Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah, Mordecai, uh, Ezra. One of the questions is, who uh, wrote the book of Esther? We believe it was her uncle, her cousin, uncle, actually was her uncle, uh, Mordecai. And then other writers, Nehemiah, Malachi, and then Anonymous. So read uh, chapter uh, 2, lesson 2, and go over those um, writers. Pronounce every syllable in their in their names, and you'll have no trouble uh, pronouncing their names. For example, Kuros descendants, bottom of page thirty, Asir, Elkanah, Abiasaph, top of thirty-one, Abiasaph, Tahath, Uriel or Uriel, Uzziah, Shaul. Okay, so that about concludes this lesson for this week. Um, answer the questions on Appendix A. Before you turn them in to me, check Appendix B to make sure you have the right answers. Uh, now look here. Don't go to Appendix B and write the answers to Appendix B and send them to me because I'll say <laughs> I might send them back to you and say, no, no, I know you didn't do it right. But praise God, you're, you're men and women of integrity and you're learning and we're very proud of you. Praise God. Once again, major announcements. Number one, there will be no online live class on July 4th. However, you are responsible for sending in your assignment for that week. 
major announcement number two uh, look for an email for me uh, to begin so that when we begin our core our class our online class next week we're using a different uh, service provider rather than your go to meet me.com we'll be using free conference call dot com and um, your your ants your archive lessons or the video lessons will appear on the Paul Begley um, website under the, the the name of your course you'll see understanding the Bible lesson one understanding the Bible lesson two etc understanding the Bible lesson three on the Paul Begley website which is www dot paulbegleyprophecy.com that starts next week and then if we add a third uh, major announcement our Sunday morning service in which many of our students are attending our 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time service um, we're I'm teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit under the theme of why every believer ought to be baptized in the Holy Spirit it is eye-opening it is a blessing. It is edifying for the body of Christ. And we'll be using a different connection than what we've been using previously. Okay, so that about does it for this week. Uh, we've got about a couple minutes. Would anyone like to unmute your phone and ask any questions? Oh, uh, yeah, I uh, I don't so much have a question, but uh, and you we're talking about, you know, who wrote the Bibles and that. Oh, the first printed Bible, uh, when I was a kid, at the school, we went into, uh, in Germany to our hometown in a museum, and Johannes Gutenberg, he printed the first Bible in Germany. And I got to see all those, uh, you know, the museum. Good, good, good. Gutenberg, Gutenberg, yeah. Johann, Johann, Johannes yeah. Gutenberg. Oh, das ist good, my, 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 das ist good, my friend. Das, das yeah, is good. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I was to be 2,500 some years old, so it was all still there and that I was amazed. <laughs> praise God, <laughs> praise God. One of the reasons why Gutenberg the, uh, discovered invented the printing press was that the bible could be mass produced mass produced thank you Amen. so much sister sylvia praise god yes. and um <laughs> praise god but you know and when you look at and later on we, i'll be i'll share with you about the story of how the bible got into german into the german vernacular or uh, from latin to german that was a story the 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 latins the 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 uh, Vatican did not want the Bible in the German language or the French language or the mm -hmm. English language. Many people died, Sylvia, as a result of that. Thank you very much for that information. Anybody else mm -hmm. want to unmute your phone and ask a question or, or share anything? Hey, Dr. Carter. Hey, Roy, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Um, yeah, I do have a I do have a couple questions here. Um, one of them is, um, and when it comes to the New Testament and the Old Testament, the um, we know that the uh, in the New Testament they had the Pentecost, and that they received the Holy Spirit um, from Pentecost, and we can say that the uh, they were inspired to write uh, their writings were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but for the Old Testament. Um, they wrote uh, in a different way, I would imagine. It would, do, would, would we just say that, that they were inspired just by Rima? Or, or what would we say is if somebody asked us what's the difference between the inspiration of the New Testament and the Old Testament? I would say take them back to uh, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, Ben. I mean, Roy, okay? Take them back to Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. God, who in sundry times and in diverse manners spoke to us, uh, uh, spoke to the fathers by the prophets. God did not change his method, Roy. Okay? Um, here's what happened, Roy. We changed his method of operation. We changed because we, we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit taking place in uh 
in in the book of Acts and in the New Testament church. But God used the same method in speaking to Isaiah in the Old Testament and Jeremiah and Hosea and um, and um, the others. He spoke to them and they wrote. Uh, some of them wrote their sermons and their messages. Some wrote this, what God gave them and it carried over the same approach. God used the same approach. I believe with Matthew, even though Matthew had uh, had more access to um, what was already written, Matthew had access to Mark's book, which had been Mark's gospel, which had been written. Mark was able to work with Paul and with Peter and the other apostles and glean stories. But God, it was God, the Holy Spirit, who inspired Mark, uh, uh, Luke, Paul, James, uh, Peter, John to write. Uh, and, and I would say the, the same method God used in the Old Testament, Roy, the, when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon these writers, they wrote the same thing happened in the New Testament. That's what our scripture shows us. I guess we don't have time for one more question, do we? Yes, we do. Yes, we. You're Roy Rosser, man. We've got time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, this is this one's a little bit uh, offhanded kind of a question here. Um, it's it's about the what I've heard uh, the the book of the Enoch. Yes. I know that's not in, in our Bible, but would that would that fall under maybe an an apocrypha? Or a pseudepigrapha? It it, it probably I believe in a, the book of Enoch uh, falls into both categories. Okay, I think the apocryphal books list him and list that book, and the uh, pseudepigrapha list the book of Enoch. And a lot of your social organizations put a lot of weight on the book of Enoch. Dustina says it's very eye opening. But Dustina, I'm also uh, urging you to use caution because um, the scripture says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for uh, reproof, for correction, and for instruction. Don't get carried away out there. Now, I've got a couple former students, uh, um, Dustina, who are rebellious. And they're out there teaching. They're preaching from the book of Enoch. They're preaching from the apocryphal books. I just let them alone. I'm, I let them go. Let them go. Hey, Roy, you can't stop a person from doing what they want to do, can you? <laughs> no. no, you can't. <laughs> but I, I, I just say use caution. Stay within what God is saying. Okay, this, this Bible, this Bible. When you get outside the Bible, when you when you look at sources other than what we see between Genesis and Revelation, when, no matter how popular it is, no matter how much uh, uh, that's in it, uh, still we must stay within the Bible. One of my most popular books, I love Les Miserables. I love Les Mis. I've read a couple times, uh, but Les Mis does not supersede the Bible. Okay, you got my drift? All right. Thank you. Any more questions? You have another one, Roy. <laughs> okay. I'm sure I could think of more if you let me. Okay, okay, okay. And and I am not I'm not an authority on the scriptures, but I will try my best to answer you with scripture, Roy. Okay? Thank you. As popular as the book of Enoch is, as pop even first and second Macca uh, Maccabees. That's that is where we get most of our history, Roy, about what happened during the 400 years when God did not speak to any prophet. There was no prophecy between Malachi and John the Baptist. There was no prophecy. 400 years of darkness. So what happened uh, during those years? Much of our history we get, we gather from the writings in First and Second Maccabees. So, but yet these books were not considered divine writ or anointed or uh, can they were not canonized. 
Well, thank you. You know, because these questions do come up, and I'm not just trying to learn from myself. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way if if my children ask me or somebody brings it to them or something like that. How do I? What do I tell them? And so yes. it's good to hear other Christians' opinions on that. Exactly. Now you cannot forbid them from reading them because if you say no, don't read this, that means they're going to go read it. Um, but uh, if you say if if you do read these books, read them and and give them the framework, the framework for reading these. If you read these books, understand that these books are considered or classified as, and then and then and and then on the other side. But the Bible says so. Um, people ought to have the freedom to read these books, but uh, as as uh, ministers of the gospel and as students of the Bible, uh, we don't preach. Uh, we don't take our sermons from these apocryphal and pseudepigraphal pigraphal books. Although I just mentioned, I've got a couple of former students. They're out there. I mean, they just left left the ministry they're out there but they they come home and when they come home we got to love them back up and all that okay <laughs> <laughs> any other questions dustina any questions thanks for your comments christy any questions shauna any yeah. questions? okay christy mr carter i'm having a hard time where do i find out about I can't pronounce it. It's Eleazar. Eleazar. Yeah. Where do they? Where is he at? <laughs> Eleazar was the, Eleazar was a priest. Okay. Okay. You'll find him in. Um, um, you'll find him in in um, Exodus. Okay. Numbers. Okay. Eleazar was the son of um Aaron. Okay. All right. Awesome. So, okay. So, Thank so he, you. He's the high priest. He's the son of Aaron. And then when you get to Phineas, Phineas becomes a priest. He's the son of Eleazar. Okay. okay. I've never studied the the lineage of the priest before, so I was a little stumped. Thank you. Okay. And here <laughs> hey, hey Christy, here's a little hint. Okay, I'm going to give you a little secret, and I'm going to share okay. with everybody. Uh, if you're ever in doubt, you can go to, I like, www.biblegateway.com. Okay. And you can type in Eliezer at the top, and they give you scriptures dealing with Eliezer. Okay. Then if you want to see who studied on Eliezer, uh in Google, you can Google who was Eliezer, Eliezer, E-R on the end, and and read the various studies on Eliezer. But if you Google, and this is for everybody, if you Google, be careful. Don't take everything that's written, okay? Because some of it, as I was sharing with Roy, is what people do with the apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books. They make a whole lot out of stuff that ain't there. So that's why when in even studying these characters or studying scriptures, studying subjects, you keep your Bible as your proof test text. Okay? Anything that's not that's contrary to the teaching of the scriptures, no matter who that writer is, you gotta diss it, you gotta kick it to the curb. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, okay. Well, praise God. We we thank you, everybody, and uh, time's running out, but uh, Roy and Christy and Sean and everybody else, if you have any questions throughout the week, you can call me. Uh, my number is 404-205-1101. I'll be glad to talk with you, and um, uh, please feel free to call or uh, send me an email. Okay, and we'll be glad to uh, share with you. Hey, we love you all. We're very proud of you for your studies, and uh, we want to give God the glory and honor and praise. Let's ask uh, my wife, Jackie, to close us out in prayer. First of all, let me say hi to everybody, especially to the people, the students who are joining us for the first time. 
And then to the returning students, it's always good. And um, I'm so sorry I missed the first day of class, but I'm here, I'm back, and um, I, I want to just personally welcome you all. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this evening's study. We thank you for each individual who has joined us tonight, and we pray that you will bless them individually in their households as well. As we continue to try to seek understanding for your word and, and more clarification as to what your word is saying to us. We ask that you give us knowledge, give us wisdom, give us understanding, and even more, give us a greater thirst and hunger for a closer relationship with you. Now, Lord, as we depart by way of uh, technology, we ask that you just guide us and keep us until we meet again and that you meet every need that our students have. And we thank you for them and their diligence in seeking to know you even better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <music>